Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Can, you, can everybody see the screen, or do we need to raise things up a little bit? Are we OK? Right, if you can't hear me at any point, please shout out. Um, OK, I must... Uh, Emma's introduced me. I must thank Emma, first of all. Um, she has helped me enormously since I first came here in... I think it was 2013. I, I'm not from Binstead. I'm not even from West Sussex. I live in Brighton. Um, and I came here on the trail of the architect who restored this, Thomas Graham Jackson, who we're going to be talking about quite a lot this afternoon. And she has been so supportive and helpful and made me contacts and all that, well, far more than uh, a researcher could normally ever hope to uh, encounter when they're digging around in the locality. So thank you enormously, Emma. Uh, secondly, um, let me start with a caveat. Um, this is ongoing research. I have not finished it. Therefore, some things I don't know yet. Some things remain a mystery, at least to me. Some of you, I am assuming, are locals. If you know more than I do, if you can put me straight, if you can point me in the right direction, do please let me know. I'd love to hear from you. This is what we're going to consider today. Um, I'm going to set the scene in actually a fairly long prologue, a lot of context. I think that is important. Um, and I hope that we can end with a walkabout, both inside and outside. At the moment, it's looking far, far better than the forecast was suggesting. If it should rain, I've actually taken out seven or eight slides and shoved them in at the back. So if we can't go outside because the heavens open, there are actually a few more things I'm going to talk to you about. Um, and as Emma has just mentioned, this church has just very recently been upgraded to two star. That's pretty special. And what I want to do this afternoon is to sh point out to you and put into context um, and say a bit about, explain a bit about why some of the things here that helped to get that two-star listing are special. Because St Mary's, for all that it's a humble little church and you can easily miss it, is actually far from a bog-standard 12th century church or medieval church or West Sussex church. This church is special. OK, so what was Victorian restoration? Uh, it had a very wide remit. They defined it rather vaguely. It meant repairs. And of course, we're talking about repairing medieval buildings, old buildings. Um, it meant upgrading, modernising. The Victorians might want things to look medieval, but they didn't want to live in the Middle Ages. They wanted to be comfortable. Within the Church of England, that was part of an even bigger revamping of the sort of whole parish structure, parish life, uh, pushed by bishops but led by uh, individual parish clergy. It was driven from the bottom locally. They were revamping sort of the entire parish locality, and that, depending on your place, could mean the parsonage, we're not going to talk about it this afternoon, but a new rectory was built here, just over the road. Uh, if there was a, pa a village school, they might develop it. If there wasn't one, they might start it. At this time, Binstead didn't have its own school. It sent its children to Slindon. Slightly later, they then were moved for reasons I don't know, and they went to Walberton instead. And so the church is part of a bigger revamping, revitalisation, modernisation and it, um, it marks a new way of thinking. It's a generational change. The man who was the rector, he was uh, appointed in 1863, his predecessor had been ordained in 1815 in the Regency. It was a different world. And the clergy who are new in the 1840s, 50s, 60s have different values, different ambitions, different priorities to the clergy of previous generations, just like the clergy now would have different priorities and so on from, the, from Mr Bones in the 1860s or the people in the 1720s. You know, the world changes even if 
much of what they're doing has actually stayed the same. Uh, and of course, this coincides with the high days of the Gothic revival. So what they're doing is they've got to make it look medieval-y. They want to be in the Middle Ages again. Now, the scale of what they did is absolutely massive. These figures are for England only, and only for the first three quarters of the 19th century. New churches built, churches rebuilt, churches restored. If it cost more than £500, Binstead cost more than £500, so it's in that figure. Uh, nobody knows the exact numbers, so it's at least £24 million in their money, which according to the Bank of England inflation calculator is at least £1.5 billion today. And this is just the Church of England. The Roman Catholics were doing it, the Methodists, the Baptists and so on. Everybody was doing this in 19th century Britain and indeed onto the continent too. Oh, hang on. Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, these are the two men who made this happen. The rector on the left and his architect on the right. The new rector, he was 38 years old. It was his first parish. Indeed, it would be his only parish. He'd done a number of curacies. He stayed here for his whole life. And his architect, Graham Jackson, who was aged 32. Bones changed his name to Lewis in 1869, but I'm going to refer to him throughout as Bones. There was no resident lord of the manor. The Binstead Manor belonged to Slindon. The Advowson, the right to present the incumbent, had been bought from the Slindon estate by Bones's father. Now, those two things together mean that Mr Bones was incredibly independent. This was basically his church. He could do what he liked. There was nobody to boss him about and say, no, 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 you can't do that because, even if it was just because I don't like it. Uh, he set the agenda. More on the architect later. So before we come to look at well, what did they change, you know, what we see around us, because basically this church is untouched since the 1868-69 restoration, uh, it would help to know a bit about well, what, what was here before, because of course we can't see it. Um, now, here you have two images of the church, one from 1805 and one from somewhere in the 1850s. We'll point out some of the, what's going on in them in a moment. Um, we very easily forget that churches have a long history of change. It wasn't just the great upheavals of the Reformation in the 16th century or the great battles of Puritan and the Civil War and so on in the 17th century or the Victorians changing so much in the 19th century. In between, let's say, 1560 to 1840, somewhere there, it's a long period of time, an enormous amount of work was done to keep these buildings going. Think about it, it's actually obvious. If they hadn't done it, they would have fallen down. They wouldn't be here. And it's very difficult for us to grasp this, to see this, because almost all of it the Victorians swept away. They didn't like it. It was debased, it was not pure, it wasn't proper, it wasn't gothic. So they cleared it all out. Uh, and so it's very difficult to see. So we have to look at things like drawings, early photographs if they exist, to see uh, uh, what it was that was here that they didn't like. Because this is to a very large degree a story of taste. Yeah, they needed some fabric repair. We'll do that in a second. But a lot of what they did here is pure taste, style, fashion. In the way that that was true in centuries before, in the Middle Ages, and has been true since. Now, old drawings can open this lost world. There are no early photographs. Uh, for this period that I know of. If you do have some, please let me know. So we're, we, we are reliant largely on things like this. 
These two show one key major change uh, that was made, and that was changing windows. Um, Non-medieval windows. Well, there's a medieval window there in the drawing of 1805. So that one, well, it isn't that one, but where that one is. But if you look at this one from the 1850s, it's gone. It's a square sash window. It's, it's not medieval, and almost certainly the equivalent one, the other side, that one, was changed at the same time. The east window, the one, well, it's where that one is, but it's not that window. It's completely different. And if these drawings are accurate, it even suggests that it was altered, it was shortened between 1805 and 1850s. It's a smaller window there than there. But that makes me want to point out one other thing. Very dangerous to rely on one drawing. A photograph is different. Mr Petrie, it's a little difficult to see here because I've got a purple blank line right on top of it. Let's go back. Yeah, there we are. Oh, no, sorry. Um, I've got the wrong... I'm messing myself up. I've got the wrong one. Yeah, there we are. Uh, see there? He's taken the, the chi slight change of roof line, as you might expect, between nave and chancel, and he's taken it down, and he's actually inset the chancel slightly. That's a fiction. He's just, he, he wasn't paying attention when he drew that bit. It has never had an indent just here. Uh, and equally, this window, which actually is that little one there, and that window, he's got this, th these two windows, that's in, th that's in almost the right place, that's in the wrong place. He's put that window there. Be careful when you look at old drawings, watercolours. They may not have been paying absolute attention to, um, to what was going on. They can make mistakes. Now, no interior image of the old church is known. If you know of one, I would love to know about it. But we do have this drawing by Adelaide Tracy, who was interested in medieval features. So she drew the font there, and she drew the piscina, which is up there, which you'll see a little bit later on. What I want to show you, however, is what she wasn't interested in, but had to draw because she wanted the font, the floor, the old floor. It's not what we have here now. It's a brick floor. Brick floors were incredibly normal, common in the Middle Ages and indeed on. You can still go into churches in East Anglia to this day and find a brick floor. And they're normally laid straight onto earth, so you have real damp problems, uh, which is a crucial reason why the Victorians would get rid of them, because they were trying to eradicate things like damp from the building. We also have this an incredibly special, rare object. It's a little cardboard model that was made, we think, from memory rather than contemporarily by an inhabitant, Charlotte Reed, uh, of the church as it was. The, the sides fold up, so it makes a little building, but it's got no roof. This is, it shows the inside that the Victorians ripped out. Um, First note texts on the wall, as required by 16th and 17th century law. First, the Lord's Prayer and the Creed on the north wall and the south wall, painted almost certainly onto the plaster. Probably, they could have been painted on a board, but more likely painted straight onto the plaster. And then the royal arms, here, here marked in green, uh, it, by law, from Elizabeth I, there had to be the royal coat of arms in every parish church. And it was somewhere there. Again, painted probably straight onto the plaster. And then, now this, this is showing the east end, so what's here behind the screen. Now it's not three windows, it's one window in the middle, and then either side in the green, the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, again, uh, 16th, 17th century law required the church to display the Ten Commandments. It was absolutely standard. Victorians tended to rip them out for reasons I've never really understood. Um, note 
However, and we're going to come back to the east window as was a little bit later. Here, she's marked and she's called it table. She doesn't say altar, she says table. Now, that's an interesting clue. We know that Bones's predecessor, Mr. Smelt, Morris Smelt, who was wrecked to here from 1815 to 1863, was as low church as you could possibly be and still be in the Church of England. He had incredibly close connections with the local congregationalists and so on. The churchmanship of the parish that Bones inherited was as low church evangelical as you could possibly get. That's an important point to note. And now she shows us the West End. Behind you, there was a gallery. Standard feature in post-Reformation churches. A gallery. Reached by an internal staircase. There are the stairs. I'm sorry if some of the writing that she's written on here is less than clear. Uh, galleries made famous perhaps most of all by Thomas Hardy, Melstock, in Under the Greenwood Tree. It's where the parish band performed. No organs and harmoniums. You had somebody with well, whatever musical instruments they'd got, a bassoon, a trumpet, a, a something or other, a viol, and they played along and maybe sang too. But also, interestingly, she marks, and you can't really read that clearly, she says grinding organ. And a grinding organ apparently was a barrel organ rather than a harmonium. And then she shows us the floor plan. Ignore up here. So from the blue line downwards, this is the nave. So from here backwards. There's a classic triple decker pulpit for the vicar, the, sorry, the rector and the parish clerk. Stand, sometimes they were only double deckers, but a three stage and the top stage was, the, the, the incumbent went up to preach the sermon in the top stage. Um, what I want to point out to you, however, is the seating arrangements for the congregation. All these rectangles and squares, which I have not put colour round, are the box pews. There are six of them. Everybody else sat on benches. And there's a row of them there, and a row of them there, and lots of rows of them there. She doesn't mark any at the back under the gallery, but I wouldn't be surprised if there were some there. And there were probably some up in the gallery too. Now, box pews... Well, these are, and I'm going to come back to this later because they're a very alien concept to us, they are appropriated private property. And they were attached to the house you lived in, in many places, and that was true here in Binston. She actually names the house that they belong to. In, she's written inside each one. If so, if you didn't live in one of those six houses... You were with the hoi polloi out on the benches. And we know from the visitation returns that the box pews only accommodated 35 people. So everybody else was squeezed in on the benches. Come back to that later. And we know from the visitation returns that the benches seated 100 people. That's 74% of the seating was all squeezed in on the benches while 26% had acres of space in their big box pews. Now, the Victorians told everybody who would listen to them, and plenty who wouldn't listen to them, that the churches they inherited were in a dreadful state, like the church itself. It was in need of drastic overhaul. Everything was just awful, they said. Um, well, don't believe everything that you read, particularly when it is campaigning propaganda. They had an agenda they were pushing and they needed as much as possible to rubbish their predecessors. We know from modern historical research that the Church of England of the 18th century and early 19th century and its buildings were not fast asleep and decrepit. Yes, there were some grotty buildings. There will always be a variation in maintenance quality. 
but we actually know that overall the condition of the church's buildings, like the condition of the church itself, was not nearly as dire as the Victorians have suggested. The, uh, oh, have I gone the wrong way? Yeah, no, um, yes. Um, now, with limited visual evidence for many places, and Binstead is among them, we can turn to documentary sources. And for the Church of England, that means inspection reports, visitation returns. They are our best source. And you've got here brief extracts from the 1859 inspection and the 1865 inspection. These are the clergy returns, so they're filled in by the rector himself. There was a separate church wardens one. And in 1859, Mr. Smelt says his church is, quote, in tolerable order. Now, that's not a ringing endorsement of fantastic quality, but it must have been so-so in his opinion. And in 1865, when Mr. Bones has been here a couple of years, this is before the Restoration, the question is, is your church, with all things appaining thereunto, kept in decent and proper order? And he says, yes. So everything is fine, the bishop is told. That makes Mr. Bones's report in 1868 to the bishop quite extraordinary. And he says, this is, I'm reading, I've copied out the text. I have had the church inspected by T.G. Jackson, M.A., architect of the Temple, London. He reports it to be in a very dilapidated state, more especially as to the roof of the nave, that is dangerous to the congregation, indeed so bad that he does not hesitate to declare it unsafe to ring the bell. Mr. Booker, builder of Walberton, has also inspected the fabric and confirms Mr. Jackson's opinion. Now that doesn't exactly tie very well with the reports of 1859 and 1865. Now that's the 3rd of April, 1868. The day before, the parish vestry met. And at the vestry, Mr Bones proposed, and this is the bit in green, was proposed by the rector that the church be repaired and restored. The day before, he writes that report to the bishop saying everything is dreadful. And what happens next is very interesting. This is the section in blue because the other people present, and there are actually only four people present at this vestry, how many people weren't there, I'm afraid I can't tell you. There's Mr Bones and three others, Mr Upton, Mr Reed, and Mr Ellis. And they say, no way. We are not funding a restoration. And they proposed an amendment to the motion that the word and restored be removed and that is voted through three to one against the rector there'll be repairs but there will not be a restoration if at first you don't succeed try a different tack at the next vestry on the 6th of june mr bones got his way but admittedly at considerable cost to himself because he said right we're going to have a restoration and i'm going to pay for it bar the money that you agreed last time to vote for repairs. You cough up that money and I will carry the rest of the bill. And that, I mean, how much argument, I mean, as you can see, the, there's not much detail in, in uh, pretty bald accounts. Um, how much argument there was, I've no idea, but that motion was approved. So the 6th of June, 1868, Restoration is on. Now, to understand why the Victorians are restoring churches, and as I explained already, restoration is about an awful lot more than physical, structural building repair, we need to be clear about the contingencies, the, uh, the trends, the norms, the ambitions, the impulses that drove this, as you saw, vast movement across the country, spending enormous sums of money. Now, 
I'm going to run through a series of influences. I'm afraid I'm going to go through them incredibly quickly because they are not the subject of our talk. But I do need to be clear about the... Con There's lots of things driving this. It's not just Mr Bones. You know, he has, like some of the people around, he has been influenced by all sorts of factors feeding in. Um, most influential among the missionaries for a switch to proper Gothic in the medieval were the Camdenians, the Cambridge Camden Society, a Cambridge University Society founded in 1839. Now, they were actually, I think, a pretty unpleasant lot. They were extremely dogmatic, if inconsistent, in their vision of the proper church, uh, the way to restore an old church, the way to build a new one. And this was their model church, All Saints Margaret Street, in, just off Oxford Street in London. And they built this to show everybody else how it should be done. This was your... If you're going to do it properly, according to them, that's what you should do. Well, we haven't got that here. Their publications, and they churn stuff out, were unbelievably influential in the 1840s and 50s. Their magazine, The Ecclesiologist, was vicious in attacking anybody uh, who did not conform to their ideas. And an architect, however eminent, they really went for the big names as well, or, or the individual buildings that they worked on. And if you were out of step with their dogmas, then be careful. Now, publication of the Ecclesiology stopped in 1868, so we do not know what they thought of the Restoration here. Uh, they never passed judgment on it. But direct Camdenian influence can, I think, be discounted. Yes, the ideas they projected you know, were, were making the weather uh, in which Bones and Jackson were operating. But neither Bones nor Jackson belonged to the society, and that's an important marker. Lots of the clergy did. Well, most of the clergy didn't. But the clergy who did were signing up to a very particular agenda. Uh, architects, similarly, neither belonged. Further, Jackson was an... Ex rather... Well, no. Jackson was a low-church evangelical himself. He was not as low, low, low as Mr Smelt uh, here for the first half of the 19th century. And he is in his writings, he, he wrote a great deal, uh, pretty clear that he thought the Camdenians were bad. Uh, he talks about they hinder the development of honest architecture. Their emphasis on symbolism he calls irrational sentimentalism. So to borrow a phrase from uh, a, an older generation church historian, Basil Clark, their, quote, science of church building was like the connection between astrology and astronomy. In other words, I mean, I, yeah, I think that speaks for itself. Meanwhile, in Oxford University, a small group from the 1830s were outspoken in what they saw as the needs and shortcomings of the Anglican church. They sought to recall it to its heritage of apostolic order, the doctrines of the early church fathers. Now, traditionally, the Oxford movement, you may know them as the Tractarians, and the Camden Society are seen and are portrayed as complementary organisations and the key drivers of this entire restoration movement and re-Gothicising, re-medievalising. It's due down to those two. Well, I think that is, and I'm not alone in thinking this, but I make clear that I'm flagging up what for some is a heretical position. I think that is grossly exaggerated. Yeah, yes, they are important, but there were a whole series of other factors that were influencing what is going on and the way it was done. It was not down just to these high churchmen, because above all, they are a tiny group within the church, particularly in the 1840s, 50s. And they do have some pet, extremely high church architects too. George Edmund Street might be the most obvious of them. It's a little group operating for a little group. And the mass, 
the great commonality of England and Wales uh, are not part of this little huddle. Now, some influences were intellectual, sentimental, aesthetic. A love of everything medieval grew from the late 17th century, became a powerful influence on the 19th century. Societies were founded to discover the past through physical evidence, documentary evidence. Like, um, so here's a nice antiquarian. Uh, here, here's the Sussex Archaeological Society, founded in 1846. Architects and clergy were often keen antiquarians. They are, a high proportion of the early members of the Sussex Society were themselves Sussex clergymen. Bones, interestingly, was not. Maybe he was not an antiquarian. Jackson most certainly was. And by the 1880s, uh, he had reached the pinnacle of antiquarian respectability. He was a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries. And then there was style. Gothic revival was one of the most influential styles of the 19th century. Now, maybe it was fanciful escapism to pretend you're in the Middle Ages. But for a while, it, the high noon of Victorian fashion demanded everything down to cutlery and cushions and chairs and wallpaper. Everything must be Gothic, rather like everything must be William Morris now. Everything must be Gothic. Fashion is an important marker of who you are or who you aspire to be. <coughs> a quite different push factor, or is it a pull factor? The Victorians were not nearly as self-assured, confident as we assume. In the 1860s, this was displayed in the new so-called battle hymns that were written. Onward Christian soldiers, fight the good fight. That's why they're called battle hymns. They have a very period-specific meaning that is now completely lost on us. Not quite a battle hymn, but the Church's One Foundation, which was written in 1866, betrays an extraordinary bearing of the soul, deep anxieties underneath and a superficial confidence. You will know this verse, and I've highlighted bits in the We see her, she's talking about the Church. We see her sore oppressed by schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed, dot, dot, dot. The cry goes up, how long? And soon the night of weeping. The night of weeping is now, 1866. And a verse which is not sung now. The church shall never perish, her dear Lord to defend, to guide, sustain and cherish, is with her to the end. Now this bit. Though there be those who hate her, and false sons, false sons in her pale, against both foe and traitor, she ever shall prevail. I mean, that's as good as the red flag. Now, claims by scholars that the Bible could not be literally true raised serious alarms, that the authors of such outrages were often clergymen. Essays and reviews was a series of essays by uh, every single one was an Anglican clergyman, uh, sceptical, asking awkward questions about all sorts of things. That the authors of such outrages uh, might even be a bishop, Bishop Colenso, who is a bishop in Africa, who raises very serious awkward problems about the textual authenticity of the book of Joshua. Now this is scandalous. And then there were scientists working away in the new fields of biology and geology who deliberately or not open up a Pandora's box of biblical reliability and the origin of species is the famous one but this one here evidence of man's place in nature by Thomas Huxley who's the man who has the great debate with Bishop Wilberforce uh, of Oxford uh, and the, there's a famous cartoon when Darwin is portrayed as a, as a monkey um, doubt. Doubt was nothing new, but the questions such publications raised made it more prevalent, even in rural West Sussex. You may think, where on earth is he going with all of this? Just up there, 
Henry Nichols, the vicar of next door Maidhurst, a keen evangelical, the man who had brought Jackson into Sussex to restore Maidhurst, and then he restored Slindon, and then he restored here. Henry Nichols resigned his living in October 1866 because he could no longer say his creed. The mania for church building and restoration was in part a fight back against such corrosive forces. Last inference, yeah, we are nearly there. Don't underestimate the potency of local pride and ambition and rivalry. The parish church was the most important public building of a village. As restoration mania gathered momentum, parishes increasingly did not want to be left behind, to be seen out of step, to be seen old-fashioned. Of Binstead's near neighbours, 12 invested in at least a partial restoration during the 20 years before this church was restored. These are the six that were done first in the 1840s and 50s. Aldingbourne, Arundel, Tangmere, East Lavington, Bury and is it, is it Houghton? How, Horton? The pace picked up in the 1860s and these six were restored in the first half of the decade. Ford, Maidhurst, mentioned it just now, Jackson did that, Sutton, Barnum, Walberton and Boxgrove. Boxgrove was done by Sir George Gilbert Scott, you know, one of the really, really big names. Finally, these three, Lyminster, Tortington, Eartham. By my calculations, these, so these are the second half of the decade, that leaves only Eastergate and Yapton unrestored among Binstead's near neighbours. And Yapton was done in 1871. The catalyst was often a new incumbent. Bones certainly seized his moment. But first he needed somewhere to live. Uh, for a hundred years and more, the rectory, the parish of Binstead had been held together with the parish of Slindon. And the rector of Binstead always lived in Slindon. And the little rectory here was rented out. And Mr Bones considered it far too inadequate. And first of all, he got permission, therefore, to build a new rectory, a suitable home for his growing family, which is the big house just down there. OK, so who was the architect? Thomas Graham Jackson, T.G. Jackson, Graham Jackson to his family. Here he is in his mid-30s, around about the time that he restored this church. Now, Jackson would become a very major late Victorian Edwardian architect, but you'd be forgiven for admitting that you've never heard of him. A pupil of George Gilbert Scott, he had been in practice only six years when he got the job at Binstead. He was a slow starter. He only hit the big time in 1876 when he won the competition to build Oxford University's examination schools. And suddenly he was thrust into the top rank and he never looked back. And in late life, he's elected ooh, a Royal Academician, Master of the Art Workers Guild. He gets the Royal Gold Medal for Architecture. He's made a baronet. His great feet perhaps were stopping Winchester Cathedral falling down. Literally, it would have fallen down just before the First World War. Uh, so an eminence of his later years, but we, of course, are talking about his early years. If you know Betjeman's poetry, you may recall this passing reference to him. Pink May, double May, dead laburnum shedding an Anglo-Jackson shade, from a poem published in 1940. Um, now... Anglo-Jackson is the style that he made his own, the heretical breakaway from Gothic for largely secular work that he made his name with in the Oxford exam schools. Uh, it's a compound of Elizabethan and Jacobean English architecture with various other bits and pieces put in, because he was pretty eclectic in, in what interested him. Uh, it's often built in red brick with cream or pink terracotta which I think is where the shedding pink May and Anglo-Jackson shade, what that reference is talking about. 
Now, whether, Jack, whether Betjeman invented the term Anglo-Jackson, I don't know, but it has stuck. And that is itself quite important. Very few architects have a whole style named after just them, one person. Now, you may know Jackson without realising it. His Hartford Bridge has become the visual metonym for Oxford, as well as Oxford University. It's phenomenally famous. You may know the story, I talked about Winchester Cathedral, you may know the story of the diver who for a lot of years, shortly before the First World War, war worked underneath the cathedral in the peat bog that it was built on, laying concrete blocks to stop the cathedral falling down. Walker is well remembered, he's got a nice little statue in the cathedral. He was working for Jackson. Walker the diver is remembered, Jackson the architect who, was, who had worked out what to do is largely forgotten. He was, by the way, at this stage, Winchester Diocesan architect. Do you like cocktails? Yes. If so, you've probably drunk out of a glass that shape. And you think, oh yeah, this is, yeah. Well, that glass was designed in around about 1870-71 by Thomas Graham Jackson. And it has caught on and is now everywhere. Part of a whole series of table glass that he made for uh, high-end, middle-class customers with advanced taste. Not your ordinary cut glass stuff, they don't do that. Uh, made by a London firm called, well it's spelt James Powell, but it's pronounced Pole, I was told. Powell, Pole and Sons of Whitefriars, just off Fleet Street. We're going to come to them later because we have some of their work in this church. We'll meet Poles again later. And if you know Oxford, you will know these. These are just a few of the buildings that Jackson created for Oxford University or individual Oxford colleges between about 1876 and 1914. Jackson is so linked to Oxford, he's often called Oxford Jackson. The one book on him, about him, Sort of an academic study is called Oxford Jackson. But we need to come back to the 1860s, the start of his 63-year-long career, when a new unknown, he secured in fairly rapid succession four church restorations, enlargements in West Sussex, the three contiguous parishes of Maidhurst, Slindon, Binstead, and then just across the Arran, Burfham. Jackson described how his early work fell into groups, one job leading on to another. These illustrate that process perfectly. When you know, he did a job somewhere and somebody liked it and they passed the word, oh, oh, you need your church doing. Look at Mr Jackson, he'll do you a good job. Now that's quite enough context. Jackson's architectural drawings are lost for this restoration, but fortunately the specification of works and part of the restoration accounts survive. Now the restoration was comprehensive, they did the whole thing in one go. Now maybe that's partly because the church is so small, but it's also partly because the whole thing was being controlled by the rector and part of the problems when you wanted to restore a church, or do you want to do anything to a church, and it would be true even now, is that ownership or response, financial responsibility for the nave and the chancel are held by different people. That's the parish, the congregation, this is the incumbent. And that could cause real problems. They would do one or the other. The reason, the reason some fabulous stories of, yeah, they restore the whole church at once, but the parish and the rector employ different architects to work on different ends of the same building. Now much that they did was pragmatic, making the building safe for continuing use. You only got to look forwards to see the way these walls lean, and as you go further east, the more they lean. Uh, six buttresses were put around the chancel to hold the walls. Weak sections of wall, rubbly, because these are made of rubble walls, standard medieval construction, just a rubble held together with cement stuff. 
they were repaired with flint. And we know from, I, Emma, you might remember, when, when would people cut holes in the plaster to see what was going on? It's a few years back, wasn't it? Is it? Right, OK, thank you. Yeah, uh, and we, I think it was that one there at the, in the West Wall. We can see, actually, some of the repairs were done in brick rather than simply stone. Um, and we know from the accounts that they cut up ledgers. We, ha we have this idea that the Victorians were very precious with all their, the antique relics that they discovered. Well, you've only got to see what they did at Lewis Priory, drive a railway through the middle of it, to know that that can't be true. Uh, Victorian restorers, and I'm afraid Jackson is among them, were notorious at pulling up ledgers, people's stone gravestones that are laid on the floor inside the church and cut them up. And we can look at some of them later. You see they've been hacked about. And some of it they get reused as ordinary paving, but also they cut some up and use them as bonding strips to hold longer sections of the wall repairs together. Right, now, remember Mr Bones reporting the roof was so dangerous they mustn't ring the bell because it might fall down on the congregation. They had hoped originally to be able to repair the roof. That proved impossible. The rock was far too extensive. So Jackson created an entirely new roof, the entire length of the church. The Victoria County history will tell you that there is some medieval woodwork up there. I'm afraid it's wrong. There's none. It's all a um, Victorian or repairs that have been done since. Uh, it's combination of tie beams, that's the great thick cross pieces, with the vertical post in the middle, that's a king post, with then the diagonal struts, is a, and this is, I'm talking about the nave section, the chancel's different, much simpler, is amazingly complicated. And here, we have two tie beams together, which make a kind of chancel arch. Now, it's said that Jackson co was copying what was here before. In fact, the accounts show us that all sorts of new work, additional work is added. This roof, I can't tell you how, because we don't have the detail, but the complexity of the structure is far greater than the old roof that was replaced. It is an exceptional piece. Uh, it shows a, a relaxing of Gothic, uh, even for churches, which is normally associated with the 1870s. And this is 1868-69. So this is right at the beginning. It's very vernacular. I mean, this, this, this is the, the roof of a barn, not the roof of a church. Um, vernacularization, the scholars call it. Again, it's part of a kind of loosening up of the, the high Victorian aesthetic. And Jackson is among the, the leaders of breaking away from strict, straight jacket Gothic. Now, the Gothic revival might look to the past for inspiration, but for all its dreamy nostalgia, enchantment with the medieval world had its limits. The Victorians didn't want to live in the 13th century. They wanted to be comfortable. And that underpinned church restorations as much as the concrete that they poured into foundations. So a basic, unglamorous, the architectural historians never talk about it, a basic was putting in things like guttering and downpipes and air bricks and suspended floors because they are trying to battle damp and drafts so they can be more comfortable. One thing I'll show you when we get outside, if the weather holds, uh, putting in a wall drain was absolutely standard. So that the guttering, the rain, the water comes down the drain pipe into a wall drain. Go anywhere else and you'll see the wall drain go round the buttresses and whatever else there is. Go to a Jackson church for about his first 25 years and you will see something quite different. He drives the wall drain through the buttresses in little tunnels. And as far as I can tell, that is unique to him. It is a signature. I, I have seen quite a lot of churches. I'm an avid, sad church crawler. And I have never seen, both in the books and ones of anybody else doing this at any point in the 19th or indeed the 20th century. Uh, and yeah, 
So, yes. Um, damp proofing floors. We talked about the bricks, probably almost certainly laid straight onto earth. Um, they would, if we look at the floor here, we've got wooden floorboards where the benches are and we've got tile walkways. The tiles are laid on concrete. The benches are a suspended floor and the air bricks keep the air going underneath. This is about trying to keep the building dry. Of course, the crucial thing that they didn't do was put in a damp course. And I'm afraid the church is looking terribly damp, damaged at the moment. Uh, that's one thing they didn't touch and uh, maybe should be criticised for. Um, so, yeah, part of the big battle against damp. Drafts. The Victorians didn't want to be drafty either. They had great big thick curtains over their windows and you pulled a, dra a curtain across the front door and so on. Perhaps your granny did that. Um, now, drafts is more difficult. Um, you could make sure the window shut properly. But um, I think basically the Victorians failed to control drafts. But Jackson, I think, was actually really rather successful. If you can turn your head around, we'll look more closely when we go walk about. At that door, you can actually see it also on the vestry one, but that's clear. the door has got a rebate. And it's been made to fit, and it's a medieval stone doorway, and the original door fitted the inset. Jackson has made a bigger door which rebates to slot into the inset as a draft, an anti-draft measure. Well, you might... Um, Jackson did this his entire career. I've seen doors that he did after the First World War, which are still rebated. Or, I've never seen a Jackson door uh, that faces an exterior or even into some staircase which is not rebated. Now again, like the tunnels through buttresses, I have looked, believe me, at a very, very large number of Victorian church doors. Even by the big names, Street and Norman Shaw and Pearson and Scott Butterfield, none of them put rebates on their doors. None of them. I have yet to see a single anybody ever do this apart from Jackson. He did have medieval precedent. There are some surviving medieval doors with rebates. And Jackson has picked up on this idea right at the beginning of his career and it runs all the way through as a very distinctive signature. We talked about guttering and down pipes already, so let's just skip on a little bit. The porch. Um, pretty. It served, there was a south porch here before, we saw that in the early drawing. He opens up a blocked north doorway and there's a vestry through there which we can open up later so you can see because there's a point to be made about that. Uh, there was, the porch is rebuilt and he makes it, it's very picturesque, it, it, it's modelled on surviving 14th, 15th century um, examples. Uh, so it's nothing like the one that was there beforehand. Right. Um, now, during a restoration, they were always incredibly concerned to preserve very carefully surviving medieval features. I mean, this, this is an era obsessed with the Middle Ages. You know, this is the, 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 what they're trying to emulate in some way. So, Jackson very carefully <laughs> preserves the font, which is there, and the piscina and ombre. Well, whether the ombre is actually pre- or post-Reformation, I'm not sure anybody knows, but they are carefully preserved. He actually even takes the font out and has it cleaned and put back again and gives it a new lead lining. Windows, surviving medieval windows. Uh, they were highly valued, like things like a font, carefully preserved. Here, that meant there was a little window there, a little window there. This one was already blocked because there's a very strange structure outside, which I'm not sure anybody really knows what it is, but it looks like a very, very peculiar tomb. 
Uh, and then there's the west window, which is rather more rebuilt. So they are carefully looked after. The stonework is repaired. During the work, the builders found remnants of a window that had been here and was blocked up. This long, thin lancet. Jackson opens it up, repairs the stonework, puts glass in it so it's brought back into use. Again, if you found little, even tiny fragments of, of a window, then you recreated it, you put it back into use. You know, the medieval is highly prized. They were also, like there, on the lookout for anything they might discover. Now, you can't see uh, these two at the moment. We won't see these till the walk around. They found two medieval tiles, and they re Jackson reset them in the floor. One is, I'm standing on it, and the other is underneath this box. We'll move the box and you can see them. Uh, this is a more interesting one. This is probably 14th, 15th century, an incised glazed tile, much rare. This is a fairly bog-standard medieval uh, encaustic tile. That was the window I was referring to. These things, there it is, and there it is. The builders uncovered these wooden stumps in the wall. And you may think, if you don't know what I'm going to talk about, you know, what on earth are they? Why are they? You know, they look seriously ugly. Excuse me while I take a quick sip. They are the sawn-off stumps of the rude beam, the medieval rood, which would have run across the church with, in the middle, a crucifix, and on either side the figure of the Virgin Mary and John the Evangelist. And, of course, all these had to go. They were destroyed. Um, help me out here, Andrew. Is Edward VI takes down rude screens? Right. Yeah, yeah. Now, whether there was a whole screen as well, I do not know. I think nobody knows. But there was certainly a beam. This was kind of the simplest version. And for a church as small as this, that's maybe all there was. Now, I mean, A, they are a fabulous testament to the violence of the English Reformation. You don't very often see clues like this of the, you know, the iconoclasm uh, that got people going uh, in the 16th century and then again in the 1640s. Um, but these are precious, for, for the likes of Jackson, that is, these are precious medieval relics. They must be carefully looked, he had them carefully cleaned and oiled or whatever, and they are left very, very visibly on display. That is deliberate. Now, every restorer and clergyman probably hoped they would find wall paintings under the post-Reformation Lime wash, whitewash. Now, Jackson and Bones struck gold. An extensive cycle. Quote, uh, um, uh, Beautiful and perfect mural paintings, both figures and decorations, which seem entirely to cover the church. There, as you will see when we walk about, that is all that's left. I don't know, I've never been able to find anything about how Victorians dealt with wall paintings when they uncovered. I mean, now you know, there's a, high, a serious science to it you know, and they, you know, people really know what they're doing and they can be very, very carefully conserved. I'm not sure whether the Victorians did anything or not. It certainly seems to be potluck. In some places they survived and in some places, and alas, Binstead is one, they did not survive. And we know that actually the paintings here, once uncovered, we know they were uncovered incredibly carefully. Jackson came down in person to supervise the, 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 un, the removal of the plaster. He made nine visits to the church during the restoration. That shows you the, the care that he took over even a little job like this. And this was a little job. Um, uh, it seems to be potluck. Had they survived, Binstead would be right up there in all the books and people would flock to see your wall paintings. Alas, that didn't happen. We talked about the windows. Okay. Um, new window, new window, heavily restored, repaired window, new window. 
Yeah, new window. Um, that early picture I showed you of the 18th, possibly even early 19th century sash windows. Got rid of them all. Horrible, nasty things. They're not proper at all. They're not inappropriate. They're debased in style. So Jackson creates medieval-looking windows. Uh, the, as far as we can tell, they didn't find any fragments of the original medieval windows there and there and there. So these are pure conjecture. We have no idea whether they're anything like the original windows. I mean, they are beautifully, scholarly, accurate, 13th century, early English windows. But I think they are completely hypothetical. And that was often the case. They, there was no evidence to show uh, what, what the original window that had been removed, what it, what it looked like. Seats, what you are sitting on. You are sitting on benches that Jackson designed. We call them pews. The Victorians did not. In Victorian vocabulary, they are open benches. Pews were what they got rid of, box pews, and they thought they were horrid. Now, Victorian benches were mostly machine-made, and like most of the kit that a Victorian church bought, and the Victorian clergy add to the paraphernalia that is needed for services, that's often why they build a vestry, because they got more clobber to house. Um, the, uh, and you'd buy this stuff, mail order from a catalogue. There were a whole series of specialist firms sprung up in the 19th century that sold mail order, catalogue, well, you name it, whatever you need, you bought, I have one of those, one of those, one of those, one of those, and one of those for my new church, thank you. Now, Jackson belongs to a very special group of what they call themselves, I think I mentioned this already, art architects who turn their back on this commercialisation. No, 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 no. They are artists, and they design every little detail themselves, right down to hinges and things. These benches are bespoke design, handmade by the contractors' carpenters. Um, bespoke designs mean that every place he goes to, his commission, things are different. It would be a problem if they weren't. Uh, Obviously, however, there can be similarities. These are the closest. I think I have seen every church that Jackson worked on in his first 30 years, so before and after Binstead. The closest, I think, are the benches he designed in Rutland for St Martin Linden just a few years before. And I mean, the, the nave benches are closer. The chancel benches are more different, but they've got the same kind of thick, chunky top. Um, now, what is, well, you may think that they are incredibly well made. They are, they, they are miles above the bog standard machine made that you would have bought from the catalogue. That, that most Victorian benches you will see in churches today, that's what they are. And they are of indifferent quality. Some are really very grotty. These are quite different. And let me point out to you why. Um, look at the construction of the back. The panel is chamfered. The top rail, the vertical one in the middle, which I think is called a muntin, they are all chamfered. The ends, both sides, well, on the outside, not on the wall side, are chamfered. Now that takes time. That costs more money. You don't do that if you're making machinery off the peg catalogue furniture. They are also made of seriously chunky, heavy timber. Standard Victorian benches do not have timber that thick. And now finally, if you can see, look at the bench end, look across the aisle to the end. 
apart from this one that Emma is sitting on, which is a modern repro, and I'm afraid failed to reproduce this very important feature. You can see incredibly visually on display three tenons. Now, you could easily think that, oh, oh this is grotty carpentry. No. This is very serious. John Ruskin, the great Victorian art critic and philosopher, preached the honesty and integrity of materials and craftsmanship. If something is made of something, whatever something is made of, it must show that it is made of. They rejected Victorian stucco, pretending to be stone. Carpentry, you must show the joints. This is honest work. Jackson describes his early life, his growing sort of his adolescence and his apprenticeship under George Gilbert Scott as, quote, steeped in Ruskin. Those bench ends shout Ruskin. They are a, a almost, almost kind of political statement. <coughs> the pulpit. Um, you might not think too much, you know, sort of look at it without too much of a glance. Oak on stone. Standard medieval combination, nothing terribly odd there. Like the benches and like everything else here, it is bespoke, designed by Jackson and handmade. It's of quality craftsmanship. These quatrefoils set not the standard way. Normally they're turned 90 degrees, so they, that is here. He's got them flat horizontally. You put the same in the window. It's a medieval form, um, but it was unusual in the Middle Ages. The Victorians used it from time to time. Butterfield rather liked it. And we are told, at least late in, uh, from a report late in Jackson's life, that he admired Butterfield very greatly, which is actually a very difficult statement to understand because Jackson and Butterfield could not be more different. However, um, this flat horizontal quatrefoil, which you have in three places here, one, two, three, uh, say, not common, but ja early Jackson, 1860s, 1870s, I'm not sure about after that, he uses a very great deal. It's clearly one of his favourite motifs. It's a clue that uh, Jackson was here. Where I'm standing, if you know this church, there is a very peculiar step. Well, you'd expect to step up into the chancel, but there's an inset here. It comes in. And you think, what on earth is going on? And you can see in the stonework a couple of places where something has been filled in. That is because that used to be here. A screen. Oak, very medievally, sort of 13th century, fitted the church nicely. Now, this is a real puzzle. Um, chancel screens are incredibly rare in Jackson's church architecture. I can't remember whether it's five or six he ever designed. We know for certain that it's his. There are his f details to the carpenter, in the specification of works. Uh, a stout evangelical, a screen was not part of Jackson's working um, ideas. This must have been Bones's idea, but why he wanted it in so small a church is, I, I think, one of the most fascinating mysteries about what to make of Mr. Bones, and I don't really know what we make of Mr. Bones. Um, but. Uh, I th it seems to me, my personal subjective opinion, that in a church so small, a screen is completely bonkers. Particularly when, and you'll see this later on, the benches, the front rows have gone. The there was one more row here. You can see the marks left on the floorboards. And there were two more rows here. This front row, the, wood, it, the, the bench was here. 
and the screen is here. It was... I don't know. Very odd. Uh, the screen. Um, have you ever noticed that and that and that and there's another one over there. These little twiddles in the plaster at the end of this internal arch is called a Scoinson arch. They're purely decorative. They serve no function whatsoever. I've never seen any anywhere of any period. I think they are, bold claim, I think they are unique. The floor. How are we doing for time? Right, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, the floor is, well, out here is ordinary. Uh, wood floorboards for where the benches are and plain red or black tiles for the walkways. Um, if there had been a bit more money and a bit more space, there might be one or two other colours. There might be some green. Um, if Certainly in the chancel there might have been. Uh, if this had been done in the 1870s, Jackson would almost certainly have added a very thin white line down the middle of the black. Uh, but the, the floor where you are, where I am, is incredibly ordinary. As opposed to this, which when we've moved the screen and you can come and have a look at, is quite extraordinary. To my mind, it is the greatest treasure of this church. And why, uh, John Betjeman, uh, his classification of something that is top-notch is, was it worth cycling 10 miles into the wind to see? That floor passes the Betjeman test, in my opinion. Let me explain why I think this is so spectacular and special. Um, first of all, it's special because what it isn't. High fashion, 1860s, but equally 1850s, and it's going on after this, dictated that chancel pavements were more elaborate than nave pavements. And the whole Gothic revival in Britain was about emulating North European medieval. And you would put down coloured tiles with patterns, encaustic tiles they call. This one I'm standing on is an encaustic tile, the medieval one they found. And into that, if you got some money, you would probably set some small pieces of very fancy marbles. And you will see lots of Victorian churches or churches restored by Victorians, certainly from about the 1850s onwards, that have got a chancel like that and this elaborate pavement of coloured clay tiles and pieces of marble. Well, there are no coloured clay tiles there. There are no pieces of marble. Well, actually, I'm not certain. Come back to that in a second. Jackson created pavements like this in the, in the beginning. We talked about this church in Rutland, 1863-66. There is part of the chancel pavement he laid. And there you can see these coloured tiles as green, and there are the pieces of marble. Just up the road there, Slindon, here is part of the chancel pavement in Slindon, exactly the same idea. But here you have got something which looks nothing like that. What is going on? Well, first of all, what he's not doing, remember, was clay tiles and marble. That floor is made of glass. I will say that again. That floor is made of glass. Come back to Victorian technology in a moment. And then it's patterns. And it's got a series of very distinctive patterns. I'm sorry, one or two of them are very poor quality. This one is taken through a glass plate looking down into the floor below. Uh, these sort of interweaving circles, figures of eight, and they go around the edge and there are some more up in the sanctuary. They are called cosmati work. You will find them in 12th, 13th century churches across Italy. There are a lot in Rome. 
And there is an example in Rome. They're made in marble, but a Cosmati pavement. That's where that piece has come from. And then you've got some very interesting shapes uh, in some of the side panels. This thing, well, I don't know, what, what do you call that shape? I don't know, that wiggle. Well, that's where it's come from, a mosaic floor like that in the Venetian Republic from, again, the 12th century. And then you've got another shape. This is the Binstead one, and again, they're in these smaller panels. What do you call that thing? It's, it's a bit like a little baby's dummy, almost. And there's the original from Byzantium, from Istanbul. And then in the middle, there's a sort of flowery thing, a little picture. There's your one. That is Jackson playing with a much earlier idea, a pluteum from Byzantine churches of the 5th, 6th, 7th, Eighth centuries. Here's a rather nice one in Torcello in the Venetian lagoon. This could not be more medieval Gothic, Gothic revival Victorian if you tried. It was made by people I've mentioned already, this firm. Pole, James Pole and Sons of Whitefriars. It cost, we know exactly, nine pounds, 12 shillings. It took 15 and a half days labor to lay. Jackson came in person to supervise. It notes, they even note, sorry, I, I should have moved on. There is the cash book of Poles recording all these details. They even tell us they were working, including Sundays. Simultaneously, 1869, Slindon had him back to start doing some elaborations in the chancel. And he put a reredos across their east wall behind the altar. It's made of exactly the same stuff. Let's stay with glass, but more conventional glass. These windows here. Um, Clear windows. The nave is really rather dark, so to maximise light for the congregation was extremely sensible. Um, though one might at this date ask why they needed very good light. 1869, this is before the 1870 Education Act. How many people in Binstead could read? Is a very good question I can't answer. I suspect literacy here was not that high. So the idea that they could read their hymn book or follow service in their prayer book is, I think, possibly fanciful for some in the congregation. But for others, that would have been no problem. In some ways, these windows are absolutely bog-standard Victorian but they are not. The lower part, these diamond panes, you'll see that all over the place. Diamond panes, square panes, rectangular panes, absolutely everywhere the Victorians do them. Cheap, easy. And most churches have got that. But what Jackson has done up the top is far from ordinary. The lead that holds the glass, they're called cames, he's twisted and played with the cames. The top of each lancet has created a kind of flower, or is it a leaf? He's being artistic with the lead. Now, by the 1880s, 1890s, arts and crafts stuff, particularly in people's houses, domestic, that sort of thing is not uncommon. It's less common in churches for that period. In the 1860s, as far as I know, Nobody was doing that in churches. Jackson was doing it from the... We can see it at Maidhurst and Slindon. He was doing it from the start. He somehow or other come up with the idea of playing with the lead. Jackson, the artist, was doing something artistic. Those are not ordinary Victorian windows. We need to look at the stained glass. Actually, I'm going to skip that one. 
Come to the east window. You can't see it properly, I'm afraid, because of the screen, but you'll see it properly later on. There's a rather poor image of it. And here is, again, from the same pole, cash book. Poles made, so poles made the floor. They made that window. They actually repaired the glass and made much of the window in that one, but we can talk about that one later on if you like. It cost 26 pounds, nine shillings. That, the Bank of England tells me, is equivalent to about 3,400 pounds a day. That strikes me actually being very cheap, 3,400. I think you get it for three and a half thousand now. Um, this is a very important piece of set of information because it tells us the window is actually designed by two different people. The lower bits, that are the, the grey is called grisé, and the flowery bits and the geometrical shapes, bottom and top and up in the there, that's Jackson. But the two pictures, left and right, the feeding of the 5,000 and the good shepherd, there they are, good shepherd feeding 5,000, were designed by somebody called Henry Holliday. Henry Holliday was a big name Victorian stained glass designer. Like Jackson, he worked freelance for Poles. Actually, he did a great deal for Poles, way more than Jackson. But what it tells us is, look here, to the Holiday from stock. Holiday did not design those two panels for Binstead. Jackson didn't go to him and say, please design me, blah and blah. Jackson took these out of Poles stock because that's why they were in stock. Holiday had designed a church for the church, a window for the church in Westerham, Kent, in 1864. And it's a whole series of panels of subjects. And here are your two. There's the Good Shepherd and there's the Fiedi of the 5000. So Jackson has swapped them over. You can also tell, although the, I'm afraid the, the quality of detail is not as ideal as I would like, uh, that uh, if you look here, for example, that he has brightened the window overall. He has actually, in some places, changed the colours completely. A white flower is red here. And then finally that leaves the two little windows in the tiny Romanesque 12th century chancel windows. There they are. Now these are a puzzle, these are a problem. Um, the accounts show they are made by Lavers and Barrow. Eight pounds, Lavers and Barrow were paid for these two little windows. But as you can see, it's been added in to the accounts that have been prepared, a whole series of bits and pieces. This is sort of various stuff, altar cloth, uh, chair and stools, altar table, there it is, from Mr Slater, whoever he is. Um, it's been added in. Now, does that mean that somebody forgot? Or does it mean that it was a very late idea in the scheme and therefore had to be inserted last minute? Lavers and Barrow are a very well-known firm of Victorian glassmakers. Um, they did employ freelance designers. It is possible that Jackson designed them, but I think actually I think that's unlikely. They don't look Jacksony to me. Not that in this period... Jackson designed much figurative glass. So they're a, they're a mystery. The whole thing that we've been talking about, it cost £867.18 and eightpence. And the Bank of England tells us that that's equivalent to about 72000 £140 today. Again, I don't believe if that conversion is accurate, if I can't believe you could do all this for only £72,140. And as I told you at the beginning, um, Mr Bones coughed up almost all of it. There was no public appeal. They didn't go to any of the organisations like the Diocesan Society or the Incorporated Church Building Society for a grant. They funded it entirely from within the parish. 
a small amount from the parish rate, £80 in subscription. So this is the money that Bone says, I will pay for everything if you give me that money that you promised already. So it is almost entirely funded from the rectory. In every sense, this project was driven by, belonged to Henry Christopher Bones, the rectory. Slindon, uh, sorry, Binstead, why did I say Slindon? Um, these are Jackson's four West Sussex restorations in the 1860s. So as you can see, actually, this was the smallest and cheapest of the four. And that's partly because they don't make the church any bigger. They don't add on an aisle. They could have lengthened the nave. They could have built a tower. But they do none of that. They keep the church the same size that it was, presumably because they didn't need it to be any bigger, even when they'd removed the seating in the gallery. And that tells us something about how realistic this restoration was. Some Victorian clergy got incredibly carried away. And looking at it from today's perspective, they burdened their parish with a church that cannot possibly be sustained because it is way too big. And that refers to building new churches as well as restoring and then enlarging older ones. Bones, for whatever reason, kept things appropriate to Binstead. But Binstead is no ordinary, small, rural West Sussex church. Historically, architecturally, it is an undervalued heritage asset that provides material evidence for significant parts of England's history, like the sawn-off rood beams, like a love of Victorian technology, new inventions. In turn, the way these tie the church into the narrative of England's past establishes meaning, valuable meaning, for a local community. St Mary Binstead is special. Right, I am I am roughly on time.